kısmındayız. Ee, çok elim bir zamanda aslında toplantı gerçekleştiriyoruz. O yüzden biraz bir epeyce içimiz bulup ancak gene de daha önceden planlanmış bir tarihti ve e, Levent'in çok yoğun bir programı var. E, Cuma günü Yunanistan'a diye dönecek. O yüzden erteleyemedik de. E, Levent Tars Karakastanis e, Essex Üniversitesi'nden doktora sınavdı. E, kamu yönetim bölümünden e, ideoloji ve diskors analizi üzerine çalışmasını tamamladı. Ve 2014 yılında Rutkistan'da e, Türkiye İnan İlişkiler üzerine bir çalışması yayınlandı. Turkish Great Relations, Rapprochement, Civil Society and the Politics of Friendship diye. E, aslında kitabını konuşacaktık ama e, kendisi biraz daha can aldığı noktalarını bizimle paylaşmak istedi. E, kendisi hakkında ufak bir bilgi vermek gerekirse, e, dediğim gibi Essex Üniversitesi doktorasını aldı. 2014'te Rutkistan çalışması yayınlandı. Şu anda Türkiye'de e, British Institute'da araştırmacı olarak görev yapıyor. Ee, devam ettirdiği proje ise Divisions, Connections and Movements Rethinking Regionality Partisi'nin projeyi yürütüyor. Ben çok fazla lafı uzatmadan sözü kendisine bırakıyorum. Ee, sunumu da İngilizce olacak. Soru cevap kısmında ise duruma göre Türkçe İngilizce devam edeceğiz. Tekrardan teşekkürler geldiniz için. Çok teşekkür ederim. Ve ilk olarak davetiniz için çok teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Ve Özellikle Cem Tanşakan, Yüzde Çolak ve Profesör Melek Fiyatı büyük bir teşekkür söylemek istiyorum bu davet için. Çünkü o çalışmalarını ve yeni yayınlanmış kitabını bu Ankara siyasalda bir fırsat, bir fırsat olarak çok değerli bir fırsat bakıyorum o sunmak, yapmak. Aynı zamanda şey, Katıldığınız için çok teşekkür ediyorum çünkü e, garip günlerde ve e, şey soma olaylar e, dan sonra bambaşka bir e, konu e, için konuşmak biraz garip geliyor şimdi konuşmalar e, var diş, e, dışarıda ben gördüm e, şey Türkçe'm biraz daha iyi olsaydı o konuşmak Türkçe'de yapardım ama o kadar hala o kadar iyi değil ve böyle bir karar verdim e, bu e, sunum için çok geniş ya da kitabın bütün argümanları sunmak değil biraz bir kısmına daha daha ayrıntılı sunmak istiyorum bunun için hem de deneysel bilgileri hem de teorik argümanları biraz daha derisine girmek tercih ettim şey bu Kitap şimdi e, yeni çıktı bir hafta on gün önce. E, kitapta ne yapıyorum? Oturlardan beri Türk-Yunan hem devletleri arasında ama özellikle ki toplumun arasında tanıtma, barış ve dostluk girişimlerinin bir jenerolojisi yapıyorum. E, nasıl yapıyorum? Oturlardan e, bugüne kadar o Türk-Yunan dostluğu e, söylemi e, takip edip her fark dönemde bu söyleminin ana temsilcisi kim olduğunu sosyal ve siyasal grup olarak e, hangi delozine bağlı olduğunu ve bayışı o, o, o dostluğu nasıl hayal ettiğini e, gösterip değerlendiriyorum e, bu kitapta ve, ve bu bariş girişimleri ve bu dostluk söylemi ne zaman marjinal, ne zaman daha güçlü, ne zaman daha hegemon, e, egemen pardon, olduğunu e, sunmaya çalışıyorum. Şimdi, e, bugün özellikle e, 80'lerde ve 90'larda Ege Denizi'nin e, sinirlen, sinirlerindeki barış ve dostluk girişimleri hakkında konuşacağım. Neden? İlk olarak Türk-Yunan ilişkilerin e, bibliografisinde en az yer alan bir konu olduğu için ve aynı zamanda e, 1999'dan sonra e, iyileşmiş Türk-Yunan ilişkilerinin bir altı yapı olarak görüyorum onu. Bu konuşabiliriz neden ve umarım e, bu e, sebepleri sunacağım bu e, sunumda. Tamam, İngilizce olacak şimdi. <gülüyor> So, um, what I intend to do with this paper 
is to explore the, the relation between two types of uh, borders and frontiers as part of what I would call a logic of cross-national politics of uh, reconciliation. So, national borders, political frontiers. Sorry about this, I mean I will notify you when I change the uh, slides so you can actually check <laughs> um, uh, the screen. So, at the first instance, uh, one would think that uh, these layers appear quite different. And that's quite uh, normal to think like this. Why? National borders appear most of the time as this physical separation, a de jure territorial, relatively stable separation between countries. In our case, we will be looking at the Aegean Sea border separating uh, Greece and Turkey. The second, political frontiers, appear usually to be more abstract as they refer to identities, ideological affiliations and ideas resulting in the formation of more fluid social groups. In our case, it will be a border uh, defined significantly by, by the name the left in Greece and Turkey. And by using this name I'm not referring to a very stable and very defined political identity, but, but as you will see uh, in what follows, a kind of mode of attachment and uh, the frontier here won't be between left and right as a very standard uh, approach would be, but a bit more uh, ambiguous. However, what actually connects these two different types of uh, borders is the effective investment projected upon them. The way, in the sense that the way which people construct their emotional attachments in relation to this type of borders, and the way in which such borders create categories of enemies and friends. So, I will argue that in the politics of cross national reconciliation, these two different types of boundaries not only share this kind of characteristics of producing enemies and friends but it, they also intersect intensively and it is usually through their mutual transformation that the positive result for overcoming conflict can come about and this has been the case uh, with uh, the emergence the emergence of uh, peace politics at the Aegean borders that I will be talking about so what I'm going to show through the empirical case that I will talk about is um, that this mutual transformation takes place through a simultaneous politicization and depoliticization of those borders. A quite a contradictory thing, one would say. How can we have it at the same time politicization and depoliticization? So, in order to tame this kind of contradiction, I will introduce a concept that I introduced in the book called borders frontiers in difference with this pompous word from the work of uh, Jacques Derrida, which I hope in the course of this talk I, I, make, I will make it uh, sound a bit simpler than it sounds at first sight. So, in the first part of the presentation I will show the distinct empirical and realities and histories of those different kind of borders by focusing on each of them. And then on the second, I will focus more on the explanatory interpretive schema through a conversation with this uh, post-structuralist political theory. National borders. The Aegean Sea waters, the natural boundary separating Turkey from an array of Greek islands uh, scattered through the, its lengthy coast, have led at the center of the Greek-Turkish uh, relations in quite contradictory ways. For instance, uh, standing at the end, uh, at the town of uh, Molivos in the Greek island of Lesbos, which some of you might know, the lights of the Babaka Lake Cape on the Turkish coast seem to be close at hand. And one gets the very same feeling from a dozen viewpoints scattered along the Aegean Sea borderline. The other is distinctly close, close at hand, but the traces, uh, but at the same time, is distinctly separated by, by the seaboard. So, um, <clears throat> taking into, into consideration the 
the history of big data relations and uh, actually the contentious history of big data relations, uh, such proximity to the border creates from the very, very start a dilemma over its possible translation. And this goes from both sides. From the one side, uh, if we combine this proximity with, a, with the echo of the memories of conflict, the mutual atrocities during the Greek-Turkish War of 1919-23, the traces of dis displacement after the uh, 1923 population exchange, but also the load of negative stereotypes with which both Greeks and Turks have grown up for years and uh, building stereotypes against each other. This proximity intensifies a common feeling of mistrust. So, being close to that border means that mainly one might feel vulnerable. Actually, it is true, the, the truth is that uh, it has been mainly the GNC that it is the apple of this court, specifically after 1974, when uh, I mean there has been a growth of uh, bilateral problems between Greece and Turkey. It's, it's, always, been, it's always been there. It's the, the old crisis, the Emir Karda crisis. It's always the place that someone might expect that a war might explode. At the same time, however, as the basis, the basic thesis of border studies and border theory uh, claims, proximity to the border can make contact easier. And again, indeed, in contrast to the northern land uh, border of Evros Meris River, which is it was mined for years. Uh, lately, we have uh, a wall separating uh, Greece and Turkey in order to obstruct immigrants from crossing. The Aegean Sea uh, borders have been constantly crisscrossed with catches, with small boats, with bigger boats, with ferry boats, with uh, uh, whatever one can imagine, even at the most tense of times. However, we can talk a bit later uh, I mean about the human cost of this crossing if we think about immigration. But this is another topic. Uh, so, proximity to the border connects and disconnects at the same time. So what it remains open, open to a hegemonic struggle to infuse meaning to this proximity is whether this proximity would be felt as vulnerability or a possibility of contact as enmity or friendship. So, it is this shift of content, content in the meaning and the conditions of a passage from enmity to friendship that I want to shed light on with this uh, talk, both empirically and theoretically. And uh, actually, the interesting thing is that the history of this trans translation from enmity to friendship is as old as Greek Turkish relations themselves. The slogan Greek Turkish friendship or Turkish Greek friendship that lives until today, as you can see in this uh, selection of photographs from the Facebook uh, groups that lie at the bottom of it, was put into circulation already from the 1930s, initially as the signpost of uh, Atatürk and Venizelos' vision for a perpetual Turkish Greek peace. And uh, if you can see at the top, Yes, there is a, one of um, uh, the Turkinan Dustu, the guy sits, uh, an article by the Fit Dustu in Jumbriet in uh, 1931. Despite that, the fact that uh, until 1974 this discourse had actually no societal ground, it was mainly an elitist discourse produced by the elites. Still, it was a very, very vibrant discourse produced, either at the beginning by Venizelos Atatürk and Inunu as this kind of political vision to educate the masses and educate the people that we can be friends in the future, or after 1950s, when both countries enter NATO, as a kind of friends against the beginning. So it was a kind of discourse on friendship with a big dose of anti-communist that was binding the two countries as friends against the USSR uh, as part of what was called the free world. <laughs> so, in 
So then 1974 comes and uh, the war in Cyprus, an actual war, although there was a long period of um, conflict in, in the island since uh, 1964 mainly. But with the actual Greek Turkish war in Cyprus, uh, the war in Cyprus, uh, what uh, was signaled was actually the death of this Greek Turkish friendship idea as an elitist idea, as an idea of that the elites, political elites or business elites of the period, could actually reproduce. But this was not the end of the story. Because then, and, and this actually brings us closer to what would be the political frontiers, there were new uh, producers of this discourse uh, that kind of renew, renewed the message of Greek Turkish friendship by providing new content into it. So, the new condition emerging after 1974 is that the left, I'm returning back to ambiguous term, uh, in both countries became gradually the pioneer of a renewed reconciliated discourse between Turks and Greeks. Why? There are four conditions that I would like to refer to uh, and explain why this happened. First, the Cyprus war actually operated as a wake-up call for the Greek and the Turkish left. A wake-up call, why? For the detrimental effects that nationalism had for the islands and for both uh, societies, a nationalism to which both the Greek and the Turkish left had actually surrend had surrendered in the 60s and the early 70s. So what you have after in the mid 70s and late 70s is the birth of a peace movement within the left, specifically with the emergence of Baish Derme in uh, Turkey and the collaboration with the uh, counterpart which was a much older organization for a committee for peace in Greece. We, they hold meetings, they hold regular uh, festivals, and it's one of the first time after Cyprus that people of uh, the left do actually get together. The second and the third reason are connected with the 1980s uh, coup d'état in Turkey, which plays actually a double role. First, uh, the Turkish coup intensifies feelings of political intimacy between the Greek and the Turkish left. Why? Because people realize that there is a whole generation of people that were identified as leftist or identified with the claims of the left. May, it might be center left or Taninsul, whatever. But they, they, they shared a similar experience, which was violence addressed, uh, infused to them, by a generally right-wing parastate, and state and second, similar aspirations for a democratic society. And this was a, a, a realization that despite the national tension that existed between them, even within the left, there was a realization of a kind of uh, common, uh, common beliefs and common ideals. This is a very interesting picture. It is from uh, uh, September, I think it's 18th or 17th, 1980. There is a huge rally organized in Athens in support of what it was coined as the Turkish Democrats. So it is a huge rally organized by the um, Students Association, FA, uh, against the Turkish school and in favor and support of the Turkish uh, counterparts, as Turkish Democrats, not specifically left. So, uh, the second effect of uh, the coup was that, as you know much better than me, there was a huge row of political refugees leaving Turkey to escape either the state terror or uh, violence, <coughs> and mainly go towards uh, Germany or UK, but most of them, the biggest percentage of them, passes through Greece, and some of them, few of them, but not such a few number, I mean it was more than like 500 people stayed, and people stayed for more until they managed actually to go away. What did this do? It did create for the first time 
an actual prolonged contact between Turkish and Greek, Greek political groups within the general cadre of the left. Before, the, before that, what you had is like in the picture we saw before, you know, meetings at specific uh, times for five days, for a week, for a festival, and then everybody will go back. What you have in Athens for the years between uh, 1983 mainly until the mid-90s, you have actual Greek Turkish solidarity groups that work together and recreate political identities by being together. Finally, the fourth, and this actually takes me to start linking the Aegean sea borders with the political frontiers, towards the end of the 1980s, a left polar quite innovative for that period and quite vibrant, growing movement for Greek Turkey's reconciliation and friendship appeared exactly there at the Aegean Sea borders. Why there and why then? Um, taking all the previous conditions in mind, the added element was an interesting political coincidence that takes place both in Greece and Turkey. In, from the Turkey side, uh, after the first uh, three local elections in 1984 and 1987, after that, some center-left parties, like Sodep, HAP, and later uh, CHP, succeeded in gaining power at the local level in some Aegean municipalities. The most significant of them is Dikili and Osman Özgüven. Uh, in Greece, it's a very interesting coincidence because Imagine that the Greek left is maybe not as fragmented, but extremely fragmented left. It resembles a bit to the, what the political map uh, of Turkey. So in 1987, 1988, it's the first time and only time that the Greek left unites. So by uniting, they managed to actually succeed in uh, gaining power at some local governments, again at the um, Aegean Islands. And Mytilini, the town of Mytilini in Lesbos, was one of the most significant cases. So what this electoral success of left-oriented candidates in these local governments gave uh, was a renew of the friendship movement uh, and the greek Turkish friendship discourse with a totally different uh, content. The greek Turkish festivals organized between Mytilini and uh, Dikili, pioneered such a movement, already since 1988. In contrast to the bilateral interstate tensions that were high during the period, if you, if you think about it, it was 1987 that the big crisis with Sismic II took place, just before the meeting of uh, uh, Papandreou and Ozal at Davos, and then that produce some results, but then these results were actually unusual. Um, so within this kind of tension, you have the growth of a woman that tries to speak about peace in the Aegean and uh, reconciliation. Um, the Mytilene example was followed by the collaboration between several municipalities in Lesbos, but also spread across uh, the Aegean specifically with uh, the collaboration between Yeris, the, the circle with no name, because I forgot to put it, with Bergamo, and then uh, the town twinning projects, projects between uh, Sakizadas, Hios, and Cheshme, and later uh, Kusadashi and Samos. Didim was a bit later in kind of participating in the whole network of peace and uh, French politics in the region. The very interesting thing is that what you also had during that period, it was uh, the birth of an environmentalist movement uh, that brought together both Greek and Turkish activists, specifically in relation to the prospect of uh, gold mining in the um, region of Ovaj. So there is a quite strong movement uh, then that brings uh, together several meetings with uh, mayors from both sides that try to oppose the plan. Uh, all those initiatives became landmarks of a new discourse of Greek Turkish friendship from below, one could say, infusing a new meaning, meaning to the proximity to the border, friendship and intimacy instead of enmity.
Okay, let me uh, sum up until now remind you where we are. What I have, what I hope to have uh, shown until now is how this translation of proximity to the national borders as friendship or enmity was based on a specific emergence of friendship and intimacy at the terrain of political frontiers. So that was kind of the first part of the, of the paper. Let me move closer to my second argument, which uh, consists of two uh, sub arguments in order to have such a translation of enmity to friendship at the level of the national border, the only possibility to have this is to depoliticize that national border. What I mean by this is that this border should be rendered less politically loaded, less political. The establishment of closer ties between Greeks and Turks would only take place when the national border became more permeable, people actually could cross it without creating problems for them, less contestable and less contentious. But that's the interesting thing. The only way to depoliticize that border was in itself an intensively political process. The only way to depoliticize that border is to politicize political frontiers. Let me give you an example about this. In the island of uh, Lesbos, there is this famous uh, figure uh, um, of a local MP of the governmental and PASOK party called Vunatsos, um, who was, became quite famous during that period because he was fiercely against all this kind of uh, peace and friendship politics, and he was actually calling instead for the government to arm civilians in the Aegean Sea in order to protect themselves from the Turkish invasion that was coming. So, from this perspective, everybody who was opting for peace and friendship were just traitors. Um, on the of course, the, the society of Lesbos was divided in two in this. Not only the society, oh, Actually, Pasok Party, this centre-left uh, socialist party that was in power for years, itself it was divided, divided into because it was also this leftist character of some of its members that was creating this kind of tension with such a nationalist approach. Uh, in Turkey, uh, actually, Osmanus Rivera was taken to court because of uh, putting a Greek flag in an official building during uh, one of the Greek Turkish friends and festivals back then. Uh, Meet, as he said in our interview, was actually filming all, all the festivals and filming all, all the participants in order to, to re record uh, their talk. And the most interesting of all is when uh, the mayors from the two sides decided to meet in order to uh, form a campaign about the uh, Obachik gold mining, uh, Turkish port authorities blocked, stopped the boat of the Turkish participant to cross into international waters. So, in other words, it was through a politicization of internal frontiers in its society that depoliticization of the national frontier could be claimed. It was a new frontier which could, for the first time, instead of actually divide, unite Greeks and Turks. So it is this paradoxical play between depoliticization and politicization of borders that I've called frontiers of borders in difference. But before touching upon the weird term that I will, let me ask what is actually the very paradoxical thing about this combination of, between politicization and depoliticization? So the paradox. For a significant number of uh, contemporary political uh, scientists. Politicization is a very bad thing. Why? It creates rigid boundaries in societies, militarizes politics, and becomes an impediment mainly to economic development and prosperity. 
this is mainly the way that uh, people within the field of political frontiers would, uh, I, I mean, scholars that deal with political frontiers think about it, specifically from what we call the third way uh, approach. But it is also something that you can find in, in several cosmopolitan writers, or even in, in, in the writings of, for instance, Habermas, that the, the whole approach is mainly to create spaces of communication that are not defined by, the, by this border. On the other side, for some other um, critics, mainly those that come from critical political theory, uh, depoliticization is a negative thing. And what they say is that these effects are evident in the political life of contemporary liberal democracy and maybe even more evident during the recent economic crisis in Europe. What happens with depoliticization, they say? Substitution of politics with administrative policies, depriving citizens from actual political choice, diffusion of power from national to supranational, faceless, abstract financial uh, institutions. Well, like it has been the, the, the condition with the markets today. Markets is a kind of depoliticized term that just rules the way we uh, run our states and societies. Among the critiques of the politicization, uh, the controversial mind of Carl Schmitt stands out as a, a very basic source of their critique for fiercely condemning the, the depoliticizing effects of liberal democracies. For Schmitt, the depoliticization of social life brings blurred borders that promote the domination of these obscured undefined superpowers like the markets. Disguised under concepts of humanity, global society, um, diffusion of borders, etc. In contrast, what Schmidt argues is that the clarity of the political at its purity should be uh, preserved. And it is the only thing that can, uh, and it can be preserved by the existential relation between the enemies. Clear boundaries between enemies and friends. In a, in a book called Politics of Friendship, by the way, uh, Jacques Derrida notes that we need um, to rethink this. Uh, we need to rethink this relation as an, as an opposing relation. On the one hand, Derrida argues endorsing Smith's uh, critique, that this is a good diagnosis. We have a problem in contemporary liberal democracies what, with what depoliticization does. On the other hand, however, against Schmidt, he argues that acknowledging the dangers of depoliticization should not take the form of a complete denouncing of it as a process. So for Derrida, politicization and depoliticization are not mutually exclusive. Instead, what Derrida argues actually is that we need to rethink the politicization as a logic that would not necessarily target and undermine the totality of political bonds, the totality of political conflict, the totality of political borders, but as a logic that could target and hit a specific kind a specific version, a specific understanding of the political. What actually Derrida envisages through this is a depoliticization that actually attacks this very pure political that Smith talk about, the political which where borders are between extent, existential, fixed enemies, and where the possibility of destructive wars actually create these feelings of uh, connection. In this respect, what Derrida calls for is not for uh, distinguishing borders, like the critique of politicization would argue, but to think of another border that could be constructed instead of destructed. So, and in this respect, one can discern 
an added value of thinking depoliticization, not as a generalized phenomenon that would be antithetical to politicization, but as a strategy for shifting boundaries and re-establishing frontiers and borders, only of a different type. This is what I call frontiers in difference. In order to explain this parallel process of revoliticization and depoliticization and how it connects with what I've called a rethinking of Turkish Greek reconciliation processes. So, national borders, political frontiers, indifference. We're going to this pompous and a bit strange neologism of Derrida, which is actually very simple because it's the, the, it brings together two different um, qualities in, uh, in, in the world of deferring with. Uh, which is, one comes from the word uh, differ, which means to be different, to change, and the other from the verb defer, which means to be postponed, to be uh, put for a later time, or expressing this idea of transpositionality. Okay. It's, it's, it's simple in what it stands for. Let me then return to the agency borders to see if this offers us something as an interpretive scheme. So, frontiers in difference uh, at the AGNC actually meant a transformation of the frontier from a political one that separated Greeks from Turks to a political one that united in both sides of the AGNC those who were opting for peace against those who were opting for war, defense politics, class. In this sense, frontiers differ. The, the, significant, the significant frontier in the region changed. What was the main issue that we, we talk about actually changed. So, in, in this respect, a call for frontiers in difference is a call to consider that there are no essential eternal boundaries between enemies and friends, but existing borders can become flexible enough to permit change and transformation. So, in this sense, to differ means to focus on change. At the same time, however, what is also evident from the development of a peace movement at the AGNC was that frontiers were also deferred. And by this I mean that the actual history of the greek turkish border, the memory and experience of loss of life upon that border or for that border, the affective investment on this border, created and creates traces that mark the future, even if the border is depoliticized. Uh, what I mean by this is that at the GNC borderline, the new alliances of friendship were set actually deeply related to the history of the polarization of that border between the two national communities. A polarization which these kind of new groups of friends were actually trying to challenge, but by the very fact of challenging it, they were reminding or making this uh, border aware to their communities. So, my argument presented so far is that frontiers and difference can be a way to think about change of borders beyond causal relations while connecting the past with the present but also with the future. Against binary thinking, I try to show that depoliticization of certain borders does not necessarily mean apathy or an apolitical condition, but can be a precondition for recreating the political within politics of reconciliation and friendship. Even if this is only to realize that the new political borders will be always precarious. Why? And how does this, in view of kind of landing this paper somewhere, uh, connect with our rethinking of uh, the Greek text reconciliation history? So, so defer as focus on communities. Um, those 
are familiar with the Greek Turkish uh, history and specifically the groups that were involved in the conciliation might know that most of uh, the very dominant and very strong uh, supporters of that uh, reconciliation process and those reconciliation initiatives, mainly coming from the Greek communist left or many parties of what have turned out to be parts of Tehve, uh, but also parts of Mesela, for instance, East uh, parties in at the end of the 90s actually turned white nationalists. They turned actually quite against, if not the very, the very idea of pre Kurdish friendship, at least uh, they started talking about the danger that uh, national minorities are posing. Um, in a way they were distanced, they, they distanced themselves so far from the spirit of that uh, period. So one could ask the very valid question, so what did this actually lead to? Uh, my argument is, and I'm showing you now a timeline map of uh, emerging initiatives on Greek Turkish reconciliation, mainly at the base of civil society or uh, small political groups, is that um, the main idea that you will find in existing literature is that the Inia Kardak crisis in 1996 created this shock to the Greek and Turkish societies because it was finally an almost erupting war over an uninhabited, uninhabited uh, rocky island. It was just stupid. I mean, at least most of the people understood it like this. So there was an emergence an explosion of civil society initiatives uh, pressing for peace. What I'm saying is that this actually undisclosed history of Greek Turkish reconciliation at the Aegean uh, Sea uh, shows that it had been much earlier that a significant process and significant osmosis, we would say, between parts of the Greek and the Turkish left provided uh, the basis on which this kind of explosion after 1996 took place. And uh, the fact that at the end of the 90s, and specifically after the, the exchange of earthquake relief in 1999, and the explosion of the discourse on Greek Turkish friendship as huge titles, bold titles in the newspapers, the fact that actually the left lost its vanguard role in promoting Greek-Turkish reconciliation and friendship just proves again that this kind of shift of borders and the recreation of political identities is just always to remain as a precarious condition. Thanks to you for a very interesting and uh, challenging presentation. I just have a, one very small question on the, on the theory and then one empirical question. Um, what can Derrida do that history can't do? In other words, the whole depoliticization of, let's say, a binational Aegean setup um, is obviously something that is historically constituted and relatively recent. So, so I'm wondering if you replace the term Greek with Rome, and the real, if you replace the term Greek with Rome and the term Turk, 
with Sunni, Sunni Muslim, uh -huh. aren't you already there? In trying to you know denationalize and deterritorialize and therefore you kind of achieve that kind of depoliticization at the end of it by denaturalizing, if you like, <laughs> the Malaysian state, state formation mm -hmm. and the associated mutually violent kind of imposition of, of identities, if you like. So I'm, I'm a fan of, of, of you know theory, mm -hmm. but you know I'm wondering you know if you need that French person <laughs> in that case. Um, so uh, because it sounds very fancy, but you know it's. Uh, Sometimes I'm wondering if you really need them that much. Um, the other thing I'm just very out of curiosity because I, I don't know much about the, the, the Greek left and its kind of you know internal contradictions as you mentioned. But I know a little bit about the, the left in Cyprus, the Greek Cypriot left, and there you have, to my mind, a clear division between let's say a nationalist, anti-Turkish, anti-imperialist left and a more reconciliatory, if you like, by communal left. That is in, all in favor of, of you know of Greek Turkish friendship and including actually Anatolian Turkish people. But then again, you have that kind of old school, if you like, anti imperialist non alignment left that is fiercely pro Republic of Cyprus and fiercely anti occupation. I'm wondering if this, that's potentially a mirror image of, of what's going on in Greece. Thank you. Uh, I think let's go. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Both uh, very interesting and quite challenging questions, both, and uh, actually thank you for posing them. First of all, about theory. The way I look at theory is uh, just the glasses we wear in order to be able to penetrate empirical reality better. In that sense, yes, of course, it's not like uh, I discovered something. Uh, in you. It is just uh, that for me um, this contradiction between depoliticization within peace politics um, because this is the very important element of peace politics to depoliticize, to make things less contentious. So my uh, initial question did not come from theory, my initial question came by looking at the empirical fact that you have a simultaneous process and I personally needed something to bind this in my mind as an interpretive framework so, I mean, that's why I turned to this French but, yeah. but, the, but the historical starting point I'll, I'll, I'll I'll is already political no, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, to, go, to go for it, <laughs> this um, the thing is, I don't think that history in general has something to tell us prima facie. No. Because in the sense of Rum and Muslim uh, and Sunni Muslim, what is this relation? Is it a political conflict? Is it, is it uh, an issue of just different um, terrains of co coexistence? Is it actually, does it actually become conflictual identities when you have the coming of national identity politics. I mean, the, the, what I'm asking you, like turning back the question, is like, is, is there something in history that just by looking at the facts we can uh, understand what was going on? I think, I think the whole historical context, specifically in this region, where you have a continuous um, creation of different layers of identity. This is always a puzzle. Because, uh, I mean, I, I will just refer to the, to the very, um, maybe you all know the story about the room communities of Cappadocia, that when they, were, they had to be exchanged after the Lausanne Treaty, they went back to Greece, they didn't know a word of Greek, and they didn't know what the, uh, was Greek identity, Greek national identity. They were just religious communities speaking this kind of writing uh, with the uh, Greek alphabet Turkish. So I don't know if you, I answered that part of the question uh, that you posed. If not, press me more. Well, I, I thought that, you know, what, what you could start with is a, a specific historical kind of establishment of two, you know, opposing national identities that have been formed through, like, as you mentioned, various atrocities and so on. But, you know, that, that is very, to my mind, this is historically you, unique 
forming of identities that is you know conditioned by modernity, geopolitics, mm -hmm. and so on. That is um, you know as, as Nietzsche famously called it the monster of modernity. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily you know like we shouldn't take this for granted. That's what I mean. And then find a way to reconcile them. I mean they're artificial in the first place. What shouldn't we take for granted? This is sadly yeah. the thing that I don't uh, really get in, in your point. The, the, you know, the, those, the, the opposing national identities, like you said, they are not, um, the Greeks of, or the Rome of Cappadocia should demonstrate that there's nothing, so to speak, natural about them. Of course there's nothing. Uh, right. if, if, if, if there is a sense that I gave, if my talk gave the sense of there is no, something... No, no, not at all, but you say we need Derrida to be naturalized. Size. No, no, we so don't need that to to, uh, to denaturalize these kind of identities. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that's a historical process. We we need to interpret historical processes in order to understand this denaturalization. Denaturalization is also it's not a very natural thing in itself. What we need that what, what I needed that mm -hmm. for is to understand this specifically within politics of reconciliation, the role of and the ability to have politicization as an element in doing peace politics. That, that was the main issue, that why I finally needed or resorted to the river. For the other question, this is a very interesting question, because in contrast to Cyprus, which is quite a small place, in, in the sense politics are mostly face-to-face -face politics. I mean, and in this, in this sense, continuities within ideologies are more easier to pin down. Uh, what you have, in, uh, specifically in the Greek left, is a very, very interesting change of... Uh, so, people that were actually, between uh, the early 1980s, late 1970s, and mid-1990s, staunch supporters, and not only strong supporters, vanguards of the movement for Greek Turkish friendship, it was coined as that. It, it was in all, all the initiative titles coined that. However, the Greek Turkish friendship of the people, that was the new element that they added, and I'm talking mainly about uh, the Greek Communist Party, that specifically in the, in the Aegean Islands, uh, one of its MPs, Stratis Korakas, was one of the very, very significant person that put forward and pushed forward these initiatives. After 1999, specifically, when the whole Greek-Turkish reconciliation process goes under the umbrella of European Union politics, a, a big part of the Greek Communist Party becomes clearly changed, becomes clearly against this, for reasons that one can discuss. I mean, what I've, uh, I've been saying is that for instance, and this goes also uh, in Turkey, um, the ability, the, losing the ability to be a vanguard in this kind of radical politics, which is suddenly occupied by businessmen, tourism, everybody, doesn't provide you anymore with this kind of affective and political outlook. That's one, one, one of the several ideas that we can have about this change, but there is a very significant change. And this you can also see in I me. Mean, the Czech was once a supporter of the whole movement, and I mean, one can look at the ideas about uh, minorities uh, in Turkey. But do they actually say that? Okay, no, we don't like it anymore because the liberals took it away from us, or something like that? There is a very interesting uh, declaration in, in, in Mytilene in 1999 from the Zospasis, which is the major uh, press organ of the Greek Communist Party, that I have it in the book, uh, that says we don't believe anymore that uh, Greek Turkish friendship is going to be served by, uh, I mean, Greek Turkish friendship has gone under the umbrella of uh, the European Union politics, which the, their only focus is uh, the, um, the collaboration of the capital. So we think that this will not serve. The, uh, the future of the peoples. And actually, in, in one of the um, associations that were initially involved in Mytilini, they decided to uh, to give it up. So yeah, there is, there is a, a very clear change.
değişim var dedin ama hani 2013'e kadar getirdiğini de biliyorum kitapta. E, son dönemde olanlar e, hem Yunanistan'da hem Türkiye'de yani gezi bağlamında hani neler söyleyebiliriz diye onu merak ettim. Bir de göç başta bir e, konuştum aslında bahsettim duvardan. E, göç e, üzerinden tekrar bir e, böyle bir başlangıç olabilir mi olamaz mı? Hani aslında değişim ve yabancı düşmanlığına işaret ediyor ki toplum açısından da bence içinde saklı olan. E, ama mesela ben hani mültecilerle danışma derneği için çalışıyorum ve sürekli biz e, Kios ve Lesbos'taki arkadaşlarla birlikte çalışıyoruz o kadar arkadaşlarla e, sürekli gidip geliyoruz aynı şekilde yani çok benzer şeyleri 2008'den beri e, iki taraflı olarak devam ettiriyoruz ama hani konteks tamamen farklı bağlam farklı yani, yani göç çok daha zor bir alan e, devam ettirebilir mi bu hareketi ettiremez mi gibi bir şey sormak istedim. Haberim ben yapmış. The fact is that finally uh, I did manage to go up to uh, August 2014. Oh, okay. Okay. So in this sense, the Gezi and uh, the tremendous change of the political map in Greece mm-hmm. are in. I mean, I had some time to think about it. And uh, uh, what can what I can say is that it's quite interesting. What what has been happening first of all because you have two very significant um, cases of a rebirth or re-emergence of this kind of solidarities of this wider left the last years. One, it was with 2008 um, revolt in, in Greece, December 2008 events. Um, there was, for those that do not know, there was an uh, a 15-year-old boy was assassinated at the heart of Athens and there was a big explosion, unexpected and undefined and difficult to explain uh, of right, radical explosion of the Greek society against, initially against police violence, uh, then it spread against, like, with, uh, how can I say, critique against generally the, the system, the economic system, the social system. It was, I, it was not very clear what was the, the main claim of, this, of these riots. However, uh, there were solidarity campaigns throughout Europe against uh, the police violence in Greece, usually organized by Greek students abroad. That was a typical thing in France, that was a typical thing, uh, thing in uh, the United States, that was a typical thing in uh, England, in the UK. In Turkey, it was very interesting. Uh, it was mainly, it was a very strong uh, solidarity movement. Maybe you all remember the stencil Alexis Kardashev, which was spread all around uh, Istanbul. It was not organized mainly, or if any, by either Greek students or even the community. It was mainly organized by Turkish political actors in Greece. Uh, with the explosion of the Gezi uh, protest, there was almost, uh, for me, that uh, those, those days were, uh, were like crazy, because at the same time, you had the explosion of uh, a very unexpected movement for the protection of the public character of the Greek television that was shut down uh, because of the crisis in 2009. And there is this uh, very interesting, um, sorry, I'll try to find it here, very interesting uh, anger that they um, made in Greece, which was, I'll find it in just a moment. Which was, um, I don't know if you can see. It says, Er Taxi Samar Dohan. It's a combination of the word Er, which is the Greek Terete, with Taxi, and Samaras who is our Prime Minister, with Erdogan. Uh, there was a, a very interesting. Uh, so there has been a revival of this kind of 
grassroots politics. And coming to the second question, I think, uh, which is also another argument that I'm uh, pushing forward, that it's, it's, it's not only about leftist political identifications or connecting to a leftist party. It's about all this um, human rights discourse, self-critical discourse, that was produced in both the Greek and the Turkish academia during the late, during the 90s, and has actually um, brought about initiatives on the Greek side for talking about minorities, talking about immigration, and gradually, although these were developing um, independently, the last year have actually come together. And I think this will be something that will be just going deeper and deeper. One of the really nice uh, memories I have from the research is that one of the groups that uh, existed in Mithilini, which started purely as a Greek Turkish French initiative in, in the late 90s, and I don't remember their name now. Um, I don't know, in any case. Uh, because, parenthesis, the big problem with, with uh, this kind of friendship initiatives is that usually they just stuck to one uh, aim, one goal, and then the whole world changes around them, and they just keep iterating, you know, Greek Turkish friendship, Greek Turkish friendship. This is why, uh, at the end, I'm talking also about the boredom of, that this discourse brings about. In contrast, this group, when they, they saw that the major issue in Greek society was the way Greek society was treating, and Greek state and Greek society was treating immigrants, they started incorporating both the issues on immigrant rights together and start and combining the, the bridges with, they had with the Turkish side to talk about these issues. Sinipax is the name of the, okay. of the, the message. Ulusal sınırların e, dostane şekilde algılanmasında e, karşılıklı hareketlerin, geçişlerin e, ön planda olduğunu vurgulamıştım. E, ama burada eşitsiz bir durum var. Yunanistan'ın lehine. Türkler için bir vize engeli var. E, Yunanlar için aynı şey söz konusu değil. E, bunun genel olarak bu eşitsiz durumun bu ilişkilerin iyileşmesinde ne gibi bir engel teşkil ettiğini ya da e, bu eşitsizliğin giderilmesi durumunda e, nasıl bir e, gelişme olacağını çok çok güzel. Thank you very much. Well, that's a very interesting question. Actually, the issue of the the visa had been a, a common claim of the movement in both Greece and Turkey. Since the, uh, I mean, since the early, since the late eighties, um, because of course, I mean, since 1984, uh, Turkuzal lifted the visa for the Greeks, and uh, and like, and opposite, uh, the same thing did not happen for uh, for Turkish citizens. I remember talking with Sefat Ashkin, who was the mayor of Bergamo or something. And uh, she was telling me, you know, it was really difficult from their part because they were, be they were mayors and they would go to the uh, Izmir or they would come to Ankara to get a visa. They would get treated in a very negative way and they would, in the best case, they would get a visa, they had a three days meeting, they would, they would get a three days visa. And this kept going until very recently. I was uh, in a meeting at a certain point, I won't say when. Uh, there was one of the Greek Turkish initiatives, student initiatives in Istanbul a few years ago. And uh, the Greek uh, consulate there offered a reception for them. The consulate, internal consulate, was really positive towards them. And uh, 
he actually said, well, I, I, I listen that there are problems with uh, the visas. If you do have these problems, come to me. <laughs> so everybody laughed. Everybody laughed, but what this meant is that, and this has been a long, a long story, which is not unfortunately so different in recent period, is that several administrative uh, measures have been defining the actual field of the deep state nationalism in Greece, but also in Turkey. We can think about, so, what I mean by this. The, the element of, uh, of this peace movement coming together was coming together because they, both of them had a problem with the way their own state was dealing with them and the other. So this was never a problem for the movement itself. Because the Greek participants were also very critical of the condition of, of, of their counterparts not being able to take a visa. Could they do something? No, because they were actually standing as a very marginal group in the eyes of the state. And the state itself, you had like political decisions that, I mean, we know about this, political decisions that they, they were not implemented. The actual uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs did not have a proper control over the administrative uh, body at them. This could be uh, controlled by someone else or controlled by just by nationalist logics. Someone is put into a place, he's what he is, he's what he is, and implements uh, the job in the way he thinks that this kind of serves the national uh, whatever uh, you know will or is. So, in the sense, this is a very true, uh, very significant problem. But he already from uh, after the Emir Kardak crisis, Hata and Tursab, which are the main the two uh, tourist organizations, have been posing this issue as a significant issue, not only no, not only for the Turkish citizens, but for reviving tourism in the region. It's so it's been a constant claim since the uh, early 80s, that is posed constantly by them. And what we had, I mean, there was a result. There was a result during uh, Papandre, Georgos Papandreou uh, serving as uh, for, uh, Prime Minister, that it was lifted for a while, but it, then it was an issue with European politics, because as you know better than me, now the whole issue has become uh, an issue of bargaining with yes. Europe, with Europe over the return of over yes. the yes of the, the return of uh, immigrants back to Turkey. So the, this is this is not anymore a big Turkish issue. Yeah. But to answer to the question, it, it has been actually one added element showing that these kind of movements were posing a discourse that was in contrast to the official national discourse. The society. Of their states.